Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is John Moss. I'm on the staff here at the new National Museum of the U.S. Army. It's at Fort Belvoir. We are currently closed due to COVID conditions. But once we reopen, we will invite you back and hopefully you'll visit us and get to say hello. Uh, tonight, and on our book talk, we are very pleased to have with us uh, Paula Whitaker, who has uh, recently written a book, A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time, Julia Wilbur's Struggle for Purpose. And so we're very glad to have Paula with us. Uh, Paula is a professional writer and editor for organizations, including the National Institutes of Health and the National Academy of Sciences. She's a graduate of Johns Hopkins University, um, and she is a former U.S. Foreign Service officer and a staff writer for the Washington Post. So welcome, Paula. We're glad to have you with us. Thank you for inviting me. Good. Okay, well, we, um, we have a couple of slides that we're going to show, and then uh, we're going to get into some of the questions so that uh, the folks can see you and me. Okay. Um, so um, let's go to the first slide, if we could, uh, which is a picture of Julia Wilbur, She's the subject of uh, this book, and uh, based on her diary, uh, a um, New Yorker and, a, and a, a person interested in many, many causes, including abolition and uh, was active in that movement. Uh, so um, let's go uh, to, let's uh, put the slide uh, down for a brief moment. And so uh, Paula, what I would like you to do is, can you give us an overview of the book, uh, including how you found out about uh, Julia Wilbur? Sure. Um, well, first of all, again, thanks for having me. And um, one of the things that I was thinking about when I was looking at kind of the mission of the Army Museum, which I hope to visit um, when we do open, was just the whole idea of how the Army engages with the American public. And this is just sort of a very different way that a member of the public, Julia Wilbur, engaged with the Army more than 150 years ago. She was a teacher, an abolitionist in Rochester, New York, which did have a very active social, you know, kind of social reform movement at the time, mm -hmm. and was involved with a group called the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. When the mm -hmm. Civil War began, um, she, the, the group decided to send somebody, first it was going to be to Washington, D.C., she ended up in Alexandria, of course, to help with people escaping slavery. So improbably, this single middle-aged Rochester, New York school teacher in the middle of the Civil War took a train, came down here, ended up working for three years um, in, uh, in Alexandria and in Washington. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, the, uh, some of the folks that she met uh, in New York were pretty prominent, including Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony, can you tell us a little bit about how she how she knew them and, and would later uh, meet them again when she came to the uh, Alexandria area? Sure. Um, so, you know, the, the reform movement, I guess, you know, as with any kind of group of people who are like minded, they sort of seem to cross paths in various meetings and lectures and that kind of thing. Susan B. Anthony was actually a fellow teacher with Julia Wilbur in mm. the 1850s. And so that was how they first met before they both went on obviously very different paths. In fact, they defend, they helped kind of defend each other when both spoke up about having equal wages for female versus male teachers, which mm. did not go very far. Um, Frederick Douglass had moved to Rochester uh, in the 1840s, and that's where he published his North Star newspaper. So by being active in kind of anti-slavery circles, you know, she ended up, um, you know, obviously not being friends with him, but certainly visiting on more than one occasion. Um, and uh, teaching his daughter for a little while. And uh, so the, you know, they had various um, encounters that way. Much later in life, after the war, they both lived in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, and you know, they would come across each other uh, with women's rights and kind of other, um, other kind of meetings. Good. I believe we have a slide of uh, 
Douglas and Anthony, so um, we can we can see that uh, in a second here. The um, so she was very involved in these causes. Um, her family uh, situation was in that was that she was uh, single. Is that correct? She was single. She was kind of the one single uh, member of a large family. So there was a lot of caregiving responsibilities, kind of that's sort of what happened in those days. You know, the unmarried daughter took on a lot, but it also gave her a lot more freedom than she would have had had she been married. The, in other words, the freedom to come down and work uh, and work in this area, which I, I cannot picture having happened, you know, if she were married. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how did she come to uh, relocate to Alexandria during the Civil War? Right. So um, the uh, this group sent her first down to Washington, and she came armed only with kind of letters of introduction. I mean, this was not the days when you could, you know, email or call beforehand and say, hey, I'm coming, you know, what, where should I go? And just when she first got to Washington, which she sort of described as you know, the sort of chaotic, um, you know, and I'm sure people have been, have been, people have seen descriptions of, you know, Washington during the Civil War, you know, between the troops and the mud and the noise and all that kind of thing. But she went, uh, she con she connected with a group called the National Freedmen's Relief Association. And um, they said to her, oh, really, what you, where you need to be is in Alexandria. At the time, this was, she came in 1862, beginning in mid-1861, mm -hmm. um, when people, escaped slavery and came behind Union lines, which meant Washington and meant Alexandria, they would not be returned to slavery. So um, thousands of people were taking advantage of that, formerly enslaved people, and um, both Washington and Alexandria and uh, many other areas, you know, just had thousands of people coming in, um, you know, brave as can be, but certainly without the resources to really, you know, do much. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, they often got jobs with the Union Army, but you know, coming you know with housing and healthcare and that kind of thing. So relief groups um, kind of filled the vacuum. Uh, the U.S. Army, by the way, was officially responsible for freedmen's welfare, mm -hmm. but you know, kind of wasn't always doing what they needed to do. And so again, these private groups tried to come in and sort of fill the gap. So that was what she intended to do when she came down here. I mean, there was no particular you know job description or job or anything like that waiting for her. She kind of came with this mission and tried to figure out what she could do to help. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a, a slide of uh, the Alexandria waterfront area at the beginning of the Civil War. So folks can take a look uh, look at the the waterfront and the busy port of, the, uh, of Alexandria, which was uh, occupied fairly early in the war. Isn't that, isn't that right. right, Paula? Yeah, pretty much from the beginning of the war to the end. I mean, it was too strategic a location really to mm -hmm. let it stay in Confederate hands. And so as soon as Virginia uh, officially seceded in May of 1861, the Union came in and, it, you know, that was, that was um, you know, and they stayed through the war. Um, so uh, they were, there were ferries, you know, steamboat ferries kind of back and forth between Washington and Alexandria. So mm -hmm. they, basically she would have you know, landed, um, you know, on a dock like that. Uh, and um, you know her first for her first encounter, and then even while she lived in Alexandria, she often talked about going back and forth between Washington and Alexandria to you know see the sites or visit people or, or that kind of thing. So yeah, so this was this would have been very much a part of her like everyday world view. And she was she was a little taken aback by the condition of the town right. of Alexandria, right, when she first right. arrived. Right. Well, you know, it's one thing, um, uh, you know, kind of, and your farm in outside Rochester, New York, you'll say, oh, I'm going to go down here and help all these people and, you know, kind of do this sort of thing and really come down to the reality of basically an occupied city during war. I mean, it was it was quite eye opening and it did take her a while. I mean, there was definitely um, some disorientation of, you know, she was by herself. I mean, who, who could she trust? What should she do? I mean, just try to picture yourself getting into a situation like that. You know, it'd be pretty overwhelming. Um, one of the things that you had asked before, and, um, and it's kind of relevant here, is how how do we know all this, right? So she kept a diary, and fortunately for us, for history, the diary was preserved. Is that the originals at Haverford College? So by using the diary, we really get sort of a day to day look at war through a, just a very different perspective. Um, so you know, we're we're fortunate that we have it. 
and we'll we'll have a we'll have an image of that uh, in a few minutes here, uh, Paula. Um, but when she when she arrived in the area, she tried to get help from union officials and government officials, and she, and she started out pretty high up on the on the chain, right? She was not shy right. <laughs> about you know going to where she thought she needed to go. The provost marshal was the um, you know the person officially responsible for what was known as contraband affairs. They were called contrabands at the time because they were kind of contraband of war property of su southern of southerners mm -hmm. uh, legally. Um, and so um, the contraband affairs were supposed to be under the aegis of the provost marshal, who was responsible for keeping order for you know just a myriad of other tasks. And uh, they were building barracks. Um, they were rations for food. They were, you know, they were hiring um, hiring people, but really, um, you know, not doing the greatest of jobs. Mm -hmm. And did um, when she uh, when she got started, she came down by herself, um, unaccompanied, if I remember correctly. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, how how unusual was that for? Uh, a woman in the 18, middle of the 19th century to travel and take up a cause and, and basically take over a significant effort of trying to help these people. Well, it was not the usual thing that women were expected to do. They were expected to stay in their sphere, quote unquote. That was the term used at the time. Um, that said, uh, as in any war, you know, there is a certain liberation of kind of social norms. And so, um, she was she was unusual, but it's not like she was the only person. Mm -hmm. um, in Alexandria itself, about three months later, an African-American woman named Harriet Jacobs, um, some of the viewers might know of her, she wrote the book Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. She came down, she was sponsored by a Quaker group from New York City. And so um, for most of the time that Julia was in Alexandria, Harriet Jacobs was there as well. And so the two of them kind of formed a team um, to advocate on behalf of free people. They set up a clothing room, um, you know, that kind of thing for, mm. um, you know, for a couple of years. So uh, what did she, well, let's move, let's move one more slide. We have a, a view um, of the, uh, what, what was called a bird's eye view of Alexandria, which also shows the, the busy, uh, Riverport, and I believe this was around 1860, right, Paula? Do you, do you remember when this one was? Uh, it was during the war. I think it was like around 1863 or so, bird's eye view of Alexandria. And um, this is yeah. actually at the Library of Congress. You know, people could see copies of this themselves. And, and it's really um, quite accurate, you know, right. I mean, from what I gather from photos at the time. Um, but yeah, there's lots of, you know, business going on. I mean, there were tons of um, soldiers uh, there, you know, kind of in between, you know, going off to battle. There were 32 hospitals, Union hospitals set up. Um, so there was just a lot going on in, in Alexandria. So what were her efforts to help the freedmen? What did she do and what, did she, what was she able to accomplish? Um, so first of all, there were roughly uh, at, a, at the height, perhaps as many as 8,000 um, people coming in. Um, I mean, no one's ever really done sort of a, no one was, did a specific census at the time. The first thing she did was set up a clothing room. People were coming in literally with just kind of the rags on their backs and she would solicit clothing from up north uh, to, uh, to distribute, you know, in Alexandria. Um, there were barracks that were being built by the army. Um, and the original plan, for example, was just to kind of have one huge room where like everybody would sleep together. And so, you know, one of her kind of, um, I guess, advocacy uh, tasks was to, you know, successfully get separate rooms for people. So separate rooms for families, so mm -hmm. sleeping rooms. Um, there was a um, attempt afoot to take orphans and move them into a smallpox hospital, which, you know, as we know from COVID, uh, infection, being right. there somebody with an infectious disease is not a great idea. Right. So um, she advocated to, uh, you know, not to have that happen. And they, uh, she and Harriet Jacobs actually were able to set up a room and hire somebody to take care of some orphans in the barracks. Um, they were not always successful. Um, they were definitely seen as meddlesome by um, by certain ar army officers. 
Um, there was an appointed superintendent of contrabands, a white man, a minister from Connecticut, um, and they were constantly, you know, kind of butting heads with him because he, they saw him as just being way too officious and really not, you know, caring for the people, whereas, you know, um, Julia was maybe a little bit more, um, she was accused of being too soft-hearted. Hmm. So where did she get funding for what she was doing? Well, this Rochester ladies group did pay her expenses. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, for clothing and things like that, she would, you know, write to different eight, you know, relief organizations and missionary groups and women's groups in the North to get clothing sent down to Washington. And she's you know, constantly talking about getting a barrel of clothing and going to the post office and, you know, the Adams Express is going to be sending things and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So she was in uh, Alexandria from about, from 1862 to 1865. Do I have that right? Right. Mm -hmm. So where did she live while she was in Alexandria? Uh, first, she lived um, in a um, just boarded with an African American family, um, a prominent family at the time, actually the George Seaton family. Then she moved to a boarding house um, on the corner of Duke and Columbus Streets. The building still stands; it's kind of divided as apartments. But then most of the time she was in a house, they refer to it as the corner of Washington and Wolf Streets. Hmm. And it's 323 uh, and 321 South Washington Street. They still exist. Uh, 321 is a, um, a pet shop. And hmm. 323 was until recently an antique store. So um, you can kind of, I, when I was able to go up into the antique store, uh, you know, by the previous owner, and you really can see kind of the, the hallways and kind of corridors and little rooms where, um, where she lived. And then they set up the clothing room in the, uh, you know, kind of on the first floor. Mm -hmm. And that's where she stayed for most of her time. And there was a like sort of a constant struggle about, you know, getting space and getting furniture and, um, you know, a lot of sort of similar bureaucratic struggles of today um, existed back then as well. Mm -hmm. the, the Washington Street and Wolf Street location, that's near the little theater of Alexandria, isn't it? Isn't that right? Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of kitty corner across the street, exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Okay. So um, let me uh, uh, pull up the next image, and I want to ask you about this and how this relates to the story because it's in your book. Uh, and this was of the uh, Alexandria slave pen on Duke Street. How does how, how does this? If if I'm correct, this building is still standing, correct? Right. This so is... how does how does this fit into the story? Okay. Um, this was, unfortunately, um, one of the largest slave trading businesses um, in America at its, in its heyday, which was, um, you know, the kind of 1830s, 1840s. And um, uh, when the Union Army came in, they occupied the building, you know, pretty much right from the start. Um, there's a, a story that a, a enslaved man was, an older man was found, you know, somehow when they left Alexandria, they kind of left him um, and he ended up um, kind of connecting with the Michigan Regiment. But in any event, um, when the army came in, it was actually a pretty useful building, right? It was it had a lot of space. There were um, there were pens in the back, you know, where people had to stay. Um, they used it as a jail. They used it for you know, kind of offices and housing over the course of the time of um, of the war. Um, so this was a, you know one of the places that was on Julia Wilbur's rounds um, just to kind of see what was going on. They. Um, one time she was there and um, discovered that um, Union soldiers were actually um, giving what they called a shower bath treatment to um, uh, people who were not behaving correctly, you know, prisoners. And yeah. when she found out that women, it was happening to women, uh, you know, that basically army soldiers were stripping down women and, and giving them the shower bath treatment, she was just appalled as you know, anybody would, well, anybody would be, and certainly at that time, um, she decided to um, bypass kind of the military authorities in Alexandria and write a letter to um, the Assistant Secretary of War. Um, at the same time, she told folks in Rochester and they wrote a letter to Abraham Lincoln, believe it or not. And the letter came down and eventually had to be investigated uh, in Alexandria. The letters are in the archives and, um, you know, the uh, provost marshal and military governor are just um, not particularly happy that this civilian woman has gone around them to complain, sure. right? You know, kind of around the chain of command. 
um, they said that they would cease the practice, but in the meantime, as said in the letter in the archives, um, this brooding burden or this brooding meddlesome woman is just you know kind of getting too much for us. Right. Um, but but she kept on, <laughs> and so um, uh, yeah, so that was um, you know, and again, that became kind of a part of um, you know what what was going on in occupied Alexandria. So what were her? I mean, uh, I'm going to ask you what were her challenges and frustrations, and you've talked about uh, a little bit about uh, always looking for clothing and I'm sure money was was not overflowing. What were her chief frustrations and challenges that she had to overcome to to help the contraband freedmen uh, right. get back on their feet or at least to secure a safe place to live? Well, I think mainly when she saw indifference, you know, or hostility toward the cause, that was the most frustrating thing for her. And, um, you know, and just trying to find ways to get, a, get around that, that would really be the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, just, uh, I mean, she got lonely, you know, living conditions were not good. Um, you know, there was a kind of low level sickness that people kind of seemed to have during that time with various stomach and respiratory issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, she's often kind of laid low. Um, in the meantime, I mean, there's, uh, you know, a certain amount of self-doubt that um, I guess anybody would have in a challenging situation and she was not immune. So there's kind of those kind of human, uh, you know, kind of ups and downs that she had. Um, and, uh, and I guess really just kind of figuring out, you know, how is this all going to end, you know, and is it going to end well? Sure. All right, we have, a, we have another uh, slide here that uh, doesn't, uh, the, the next slide doesn't uh, pertain to Alexandria, but this image is from, uh, I believe, a newspaper uh, at the time, uh, Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper, and it um, shows the, the arrival of the Freeman in uh, Baltimore, but th this could have been right out of Alexandria too, would you say? Right, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there are a few photos um, of, you know, people, you know, not just illustration, but also photos of people just trying to, you know, again, maybe with a horse, maybe with, a, you know, an oxen, usually on foot, just mm -hmm. trying to make their way, you know, as best they can, um, you know, into safety and into freedom. Mm -hmm. And do you, did you get any, in your research, did you get any indication of the scale of this problem as far as number of freedmen coming in and the families what do you have any sense of that well at one point they um they <coughs> estimated julia wilbur and harriet jacobs that there were about eight thousand people um right. now the pre-war population of alexandria was twelve thousand um about 1500 uh, enslaved 1500 free blacks and the rest whites uh, during the civil war a lot of the whites left um but, you know, we're talking about, you know, quite a, and not to mention the all of those you know, soldiers coming in. So, you know, we're talking about sort of a, a huge population pressure, you know, on resources and on land and on everything else um, that would have occurred in Alexandria and, um, and also, you know, in Washington as well. Mm -hmm. So, as you mentioned, the army was officially responsible for the freedmen, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so can you tell us more about, you've, 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 uh, started to, to um, talk about it a little earlier. What was the army, what was the army doing in Alexandria? Uh, and I don't mean the soldiers that were kind of coming on ship and then marching out into, uh, toward Manassas and the various campaigns or south to Fredericksburg, but what was the occupation like and what was the army doing in Alexandria? Um, well, I guess the, probably the two main things were the war photograph that you showed. I mean, it was a huge, you know, quartermaster and logistics um, uh, operation going on. Um, the quartermaster, one of the quartermasters wrote something like uh, he, he, you know, showed up to, you know, for his first day of duty and there was something like, you know, send 10,000 bales of hay or, you know, and 10,000 things of ice or some kind of outrageous amount of, you know, things that needed to be, um, to be sent. So just, you know, between, there's also a lot of train, you know, between ships and train, um, railroad, um, you know, there was just a lot of kind of supply, um, you know, operations going on in Alexandria. Um, as I mentioned, there were you know, 32 Union hospitals. So, for example, after Fredericksburg, you know, hundreds of men came up to Alexandria uh, to use the hospitals. Um, 
there was a cemetery. Um, there was uh, really just kind of keeping, making sure that Alexandria stayed, um, you know, uh, stayed out of Confederate hands. So, you know, there were uh, various times, either actually or, or oftentimes rumors that, uh, you know, there was going to be raid, you know, Confederate raids on Alexandria and things had to be sort of, you know, picketed and barricaded. But it was, it turned out that there was never any like serious threat, uh, you know, during the time. But, you know, you obviously had to make sure. Mm -hmm. um, this picture that you have right here is was actually it was a bank, but it was used as the provost marshal's office, uh, you know, during the war. Um, and I sort of picture, you know, this uh, her, you know, kind of walking up this gauntlet of guys just kind of hanging out uh, to go talk to the provost marshal with some demand or request, and then thinking, oh, here she comes again. You know, right. This, <laughs> yeah, right. So you mentioned when you're talking about the population of Alexandria. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of the pro-Confederate white uh, population left the city. Uh, did she have interactions with uh, pro-Southerners during the during the period where uh, who didn't leave the city? Was she? Uh, did she have any interactions with them? Yeah, I mean, she wasn't terribly sympathetic. Uh, she used this term um, "secesh," like a short for a secessionist, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, she would talk sometimes about you know running across that. But she she made no friendships. I would have to say with you know pro Southern um, white Alexandrians. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have an image of uh, one of the officers she did deal with. The next image uh, was the, was the. Um, Military Governor of Alexandria, uh, tell us about her interactions with, with him. Right. Well, he was he was quite a character. He came into Alexandria a couple months before Julia did in the summer of eighteen sixty two, and basically he was sent to um, restore order. I mean, the, you know, there was just a lot of you know kind of drunkenness, and I mean, there were kind of you know, Alexandria kind of had his reputation. If you want a good time, you know, come down to Alexandria. Um, so he tried to impose you know, an alcohol ban and really kind of try to clamp down on what was going on um, and, uh, and governed you know, for the rest of the war in Alexandria. And really, um, from what I read of him, um, and uh, he was only like in his mid-30s, early 30s, um, you know, just had no problem like, you know, I am boss, this is what I have to say. Um, so the first time that she uh, ran across him kind of face to face was when she had this experience with you know, the, um, the, the, the decision, the possible decision to send orphans to the smallpox hospital. She and Harriet Jacobs you know, kind of gathered up all their courage and went to speak to him and he ended up agreeing with um, them mm -hmm. not to send them. So, um, uh, you know, uh, she had various other encounters with him um, and certainly knew, you know, whatever he said. I mean, he was in the papers all the time, you know, uh, very uh, careful of his image. Um, he, by the way, um, had served in the Ohio legislature before the war and was kicked out for, you know, having a brawl with a fellow leg legislator. Uh, after the war, he went to New Mexico territory and uh, was eventually, I regret to say, um, killed in some other kind of altercation with somebody else. Mm. So he had a temper, I think. <laughs> Sounds like it. So in her, in her diary, in her writings, um, did she, what did she say about the war itself? Um, what, did she, did, is there any indications on whether her abolitionism uh, made it seem like the war was a crusade or was, did she say much about the, the death and the, the deaths, the wounded that came in? Any, any indication there in her entries? Yeah, um, well, first of all, before the before she actually came down, I mean, she was following the war as obviously were many other Americans, just avidly. She had a brother-in-law who had, um, you know, volunteered early on, and so she was getting letters from him and really kind of living vicariously through him and through the newspapers. Um, and one time, you know, when she heard like, you know, soldiers kind of coming down, you know, leaving Rochester, coming down to um, Washington, she was like, oh, I, I wish I could do that too, you know? So, mm -hmm. I mean, she really, and because she really was imbued in the cause and really saw it as a way to end slavery early on. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of debate about, you know, whether it was for a lot of people, was it to preserve the union or to end slavery to do both, but she really saw it as, as the way to end slavery. Um, she visited a number of battlefields, you know, after, after the fact, obviously, Fredericksburg, Bull Run, um, out in Fairfax Station. 
um, just, you know, wrote very often about, um, you know, hearing the stories and picking up relics from the battlefields. Um, that said, you know, she um, came across former students who were like in hospitals in Alexandria. So, I mean, she saw that there was, you know, there was a, another side of the war as well. I mean, you know, kind of death and, um, and, and you know, being wounded. Um, but I think she, I mean, she was a true believer from the start to the end. Mm. Um, tell us now about the diary um, and how you uh, started working on that. We have a, we have a picture of the diary um, that I believe is also in the book as well. And let's see if we can bring that up. There, there you go. There's a, a, an image of the diary. It's pretty small. But um, can you tell tell us about the diary itself and what your impressions were? What a, what kind of got you uh, interested? Okay. In it? <laughs> um, yeah, because once you start reading it, I mean, you can get like just immersed in her world, which is really great. Um, she kept this diary from um, 1844 until her death in 1895. So we're talking about like 50 years worth of diary. Um, I got into it uh, through uh, working with Office of Historic Alexandria. Um, I've been doing some research first on the Union hospitals, and um, they uh, they had the the diary. You know, it was like I discovered the diary. It had been well known for the last um, you know for for some time, but um, no one had transcribed. Um, you know, kind of the period, it was just basically like handwriting like you're seeing here. And so originally I offered to transcribe kind of the Civil War years of her diary, kind of little yeah. knowing what I was getting myself into, but right. it took a few years and um, I did transcribe and tried to annotate it as much as I could. And then um, when I uh, had been working on it for a few years, I went up to Haverford College uh, there at Haverford because a great, great nephew was a professor mm -hmm. there and he donated, you know, the kind of this family treasure to Haverford, which we are all you know, very fortunate to that he did. Um, when uh, I discovered she actually had a whole other like parallel set of diaries, mm -hmm. um, kind of like just written kind of on, on paper, you know, not quite each, you know, a date for each entry. And so um, with a group of volunteers uh, through Alexandria Archaeology, we actually transcribed the civil, those Civil War years as well. And uh, I think you're going to have a, um, you can show the URL at the end. Both of these are, um, are you know, are online and, and are searchable for folks. Um, so, you know, again, my original plan was really, I'm just going to sort of do this service and kind of get the Civil War years of this woman's diary, you know, available to more people. But once I got into it, it's like, oh, well, who, you know, who was she? What did she do beforehand? Uh, oh, Rochester, Rochester ended up being this whole interesting thing. She ended up having this whole family crisis that um, she writes about that, you know, there's a little bit of a soap opera involved in all of this. Mm -hmm. And then it became, well, what did she do afterwards? Well, it turned out that she never went back to Rochester to live. She was in Washington, D.C. from uh, 1865 until her death in 1895. And so she saw a whole other series of you know, just fascinating events, whether uh, related to suffrage, um, just kind of Gilded Age Washington. Um, she w worked in the patent office. Um, so she was really one of the first generation of you know, kind of female government workers and kind of her experiences with that. So, you know, sort of pulling me in and I, next thing you know, I wrote a book. <laughs> You make it sound so easy. Well, well yeah, <laughs> it wasn't quite that easy, but I, I enjoyed it. It was definitely a you know, great project. So the diary we see here, the image, is is that one of several um, that she, that are there, are there more than one uh, actual book? Oh, yeah. Every right. year has its own little book. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that that one happens to be, I know it's hard to see, but that one happens to be a very momentous day because um, it was the night that Lincoln died, you know, the day after Lincoln died. Um, and, you know, she writes about, uh, you know, kind of this joyous afternoon of people celebrating in Alexandria. There was a parade and, and that kind of thing. And um, there's actually the photo that's on the cover of the book kind of shows a group of people, black and white, kind of in their best, you know, dressed clothes, you know, celebrating. Um, and on April 14th, Friday, April 14th, during the day, and that night was the night that Lincoln went to Fort Theater. So it went from that kind of joy to, you know, just the, 
mm-hmm. you know, the grief and the horror. Uh, and she's writing about, you know, hearing the bells toll that morning mm-hmm. in Alexandria um, and, uh, you know, and kind of the aftermath. So, mm-hmm. um, but a lot of the diaries also things like uh, the weather was cloudy today and I had a headache. So sure. um, there's lots of that kind of stuff too. <laughs> So did it did it surprise you at all when you were researching this that she didn't go back to Rochester after the war and stayed in in DC for uh, several decades? Right. Well, she did actually. She did go back in the summers, by the way. Anyone wants yeah. a good excuse to get out of DC summer, right, uh, to visit her family? But I think she realized that if she went back to Rochester, this kind of agency that she had gained from, um, you know, working sure. during the war, she would lose. She would once again be the kind of, you know, dutiful, you know, daughter, aunt, sister, who would just be kind of there to take care of everybody else and not do what she wanted to do. Yeah, well, I was I was surprised re- reading this that, you know, she, she had a number of siblings and a lot of relatives in Rochester, and then I believe several moved to Michigan, right? Or Yeah, yeah, uh, lot, yeah. it seemed to be a very common thing to go from upstate New York to Michigan at that time. Mm-hmm. So, um, and her her father initially was not very uh, uh, enthusiastic about her plan to move from Rochester to wa- the Washington area, is that correct? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the fact that she, you know, her way was paid by the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society was really the only way that she could have done it. Mm. Um, because by then, um, she had been working, you know, for a while. Um, she had been teaching. Um, and as I write in, in the book, she ended up taking care of a niece. And then, uh, you know, when some circumstance, family circumstances kind of went awry, she really had sort of withdrawn from life for a couple, you know, and was not making her own living. So, um, you know, get, getting these expenses um, you know, paid was a way to kind of get her, you know, get her out of that situation. Um, and, uh, you know, again, she, I mean, it's not like she cut, she severed ties with her family, quite the opposite. Uh, in fact, her sister ended up moving down here for a while and she, um, you know, was always kind of very, um, uh, what do I want to say, you know, caring of nieces and nephews and other, you know, other siblings. But, you know, but she, at that point, it was time for her to lead, lead her own life. Mm-hmm. Now um, there's a, there's a, a Freedman's Memorial on the south end of Washington Street in um, Alexandria, uh, right right where the um, uh, GW Parkway crosses right. the Beltway. Um, so, uh, which when I was many many years ago, I believe there was a gas station on that lot. Yeah, yeah, that Fort- is that is a great. I mean, that's sort of a really interesting story. So um, that had become. Unfortunately, so many people, so many freed me, freed people were dying in Alexandria because of you know just bad health. That the you know, Popper Cemetery, uh, which is a little closer to um, kind of like where Whole Foods is now. Uh, if people know Alexandria, was overflowing. So um, this Reverend Gladwin, the sub- superintendent of contrabands, confiscated some land to build a cemetery for, basically a contraband cemetery is what it was called, and it was for um, African Americans. Um, and it, it you know, was used through about 1867 or so, um, and then it kind of fell into disuse. And um, as you say, you know, just people just sort of quote unquote forgot about it, whether it, you know, it was in the, one of these things where marginalized people are often forgotten through history, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it was sold, uh, it was owned by St. Mary's uh, Parish at one point. It was sold to, you know, the private developer. The idea being, you know, just don't put a gas station on it. It was actually in the agreement. Mm. Of course, the gas station went on it. Um, in the, uh, some of the environmental work to uh, redo the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, um, the uh, cemetery, some remains were actually discovered. And so, um, uh, folks can um, now visit. It's been reconsecrated as a cemetery. Um, there's um, a list of all the people. Not the, the graves are not marked, but thanks to this Reverend Gladwin, um, he did keep a record of people who had died there. So there is at least a record of all the people. And um, a woman named Char Ba has done like amazing genealogical work to find you know many of the descendants of those people and there's been some you know a couple of uh, ceremonies that have taken place there and now 
Um, and it's actually a good outside place to go during COVID. Right, right. Um, it's really a, a really a wonderful place to visit to just kind of think about, you know, kind of history and how history just kind of comes up to the present day. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's let's take that slide down uh, if we could. And um, while before I ask a few uh, remaining questions, uh, I want to be able to um, ask Paula uh, some of the questions that have come across uh, from our, our uh, audience. Um, the first one is, is there a list or a guide to where the military hospitals were in Alexandria? Yes, there's Office of Office of Historic Alexandria has um, a great um, website. Uh, there's actually a little walking tour. Um, if you Google, you know, kind of Office of Historic Alexandria Union Hospitals, I don't, I or I can give it to folks afterwards. You will find it. Okay, great. And uh, what years do the diaries cover? Um, so all in all, her first entry is 1844 when she is starting out as a teacher, very first day as a teacher. It seems like a good momentous time to start a diary, right? Right. And um, it ends just a little bit before her death in 1895, just as kind of very kind of scraggly, you know, I just don't feel well kind of handwriting, but almost to her death. Hmm. And she, um, you know, kept it pretty much every day. Okay, and um, how old was she when she came to Alexandria? Um, let's see, she was about 40, let's see, I got to do the math here. She was about 47. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, a couple saving. more. Mm -hmm. um, did Julia's efforts get any press coverage during the war? Um, well, she submitted a few articles to papers in Rochester uh, one was a time that when she went to like a recruiting um, meeting for the U.S. Color Troops, um, and the only reason I she's just signed it like J um, J A W. I mean, it was just you know with her initials, mm -hmm. um, but she happened to mention it, and I was able to track it down in Rochester newspaper. Um, there were a couple of reporters who came who um, you know kind of extolled the efforts of her and Harriet Jacobs. Um, they're in my book, actually. Um, so you know, a few people did, but it's she was not she was not famous, you know. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the things that's kind of interesting about this whole story is she wasn't famous. She was just sort of a person trying to do her thing, and and never really sought fame for that matter. Um, even going to all these different meetings and abolitionist things, she was not like a leader of these groups. She just kind of showed up and you know tried to do her best. So. Um, yeah, but there are a few, uh, and again, I have in the book a few references to, um, you know, to articles that, um, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, were published at the time. And how long did it take you to finish the book from starting the research to getting it published? Um, well, you know, I'd already been working on the diaries, so that was my kind of leg up. Mm -hmm. uh, I got really serious about working on a book in, I think, maybe 2004. 14 or so. Um, and I submitted the manuscript in 2016. Uh, the hardback came out in 2017. Uh, the paperback came out in 2020. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, so overall, in, in reading, going through the, those diaries and, and, um, and your research, was there anything that surprised you that uh, during the research and writing? I mean, probably the most surprising thing was kind of how relatable she, you know, the experience was. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, you know, just really kind of getting immersed in it all. Um, you know, not only during the war, but even after the war. I mean, you just all, all of a sudden I'd look up and it'd be like, oh my God, you know, I'm not in like 1872 anymore. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that, that part was really great. Um, I think, you know, just the, the scale of the problem, you know, I did, I was not aware of it beforehand. And so, um, you know, the scale of the operation was, you know, certainly eye opening, you know, mm -hmm. as well. So um, there was another comment, uh, more of a comment than a question, but it raises a question that I think is a, is a good uh, thing to follow up on. Uh, after the Civil War, did she still maintain a relationship with Harriet Jacobs? Yeah, she did. Um, first of all, right after the war, the two the, the, the two of them and um, a few other women actually went down to Richmond to 
uh, I mean, I'm talking about like right after the war, like May of 1865, mm -hmm. um, to do kind of a um, same kind of like relief thing. They brought clothes and stuff with them. They stayed about six, about four to six weeks. Um, and then, you know, uh, then right after the war, they were sort of in touch. Um, Harriet Jacobs uh, moved to Savannah. She moved to Cambridge. But in 1877, when Julia is working in the patent office, she says, my friend, Mrs. J came to see me today, you know? Oh, okay. so, um, yeah, so Harriet and her daughter, Louisa, moved back to Washington and they were, uh, they maintained, you know, relations, sure. you know, connections until, um, until, you know, the end. Uh, one of our audience uh, uh, tonight, or one of our audience members has a question also, which is, um, uh, where did Julia get her beliefs regarding slavery and the importance of being a part of freeing people from slavery? Well, you know, I think, I mean, her roots were Quaker. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody is an abolitionist and yeah. someone could be an abolitionist without being a Quaker, obviously. But you know, I think that was, I mean, that definitely was kind of part of her DNA. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that was really important. Um, and then I think she just kind of had this sense of fairness, you know, and being exposed to, um, you know, would it have developed as much if she lived in a, um, you know, she grew up in a place that didn't have as strong an abolitionist tradition. I mean, obviously we have no way of knowing, um, but I think that helped as well. So I think the combination of those two things, um, you know, really helped form her. And uh, another question, did she have, did she meet um, or did she have a relationship with the Freedmen's Village and Sojourner Truth on the grounds of Arlington House at any time during the war? Well, she definitely visited um, Freedmen's Village uh, a number of times. Mm -hmm. um, she uh, had some contact with Sojourner Truth, um, but they were not, I mean, she, she met her a few times. Um, at one point, Sojourner Truth was going to come to Rochester and I don't know, she kind of, Julia was little sort of askance at what, at what she was doing. It's a, it got a little complicated. I'm not, you know, I don't want to start kind of explaining something that she was never really fully able to explain. But, you know, they, she hadn't met her, but they were not, you know, they did not have a close, you know, contact. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, before I ask my final question, uh, folks can still um, type in some questions of their own uh, in the little bit of time we have left. by. But my final question, Paula, is what or what is the subject of your next book? <laughs> um, well, I'm looking at Harriet Jacobs. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, Harriet um, uh, wrote Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, a narrative based on her own experience, uh, and published it in 1861. Um, she wrote it while she was living with a actually superstar author at the time named Nathaniel Parker Willis, who I know none of us have heard of now, but was, you know, kind of one of the kind of literary superstars of his time. And so I'm trying to kind of explore like kind of the, like a, the relationship kind of between um, Harriet Jacobs and the Willis family and particularly the women in the family. Uh, he was married twice. His first wife died. Um, who both seem to be kind of far more uh, exemplary people than he was. He was a bit of a bit of a cad, but um, anyway, so it's just kind of writing a story about them. Good. Well, I want to thank you for joining us. And thank you for having being me. being so willing to, uh, you and I have talked several times and prepared and, and um, it was very fun getting to know you virtually. Hopefully you'll be able to come out to the museum soon. I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I want to also thank uh, the museum, our the National Museum's IT department for helping us set this up uh, after hours in particular. Uh, we have another book talk coming up, uh, which we have a slide for in January, uh, January 23rd, I believe. And it is um, a new book that came out recently as part of a, a series on the revolution. Um, do we have a slide on that, I think? Here we go. Um, so the author is Mark Malloy, and um, his book is, uh, I'm sorry, January 21st at 7 p.m. Um, all of our book talks are on the third Thursday of the month. So his new book is about the battles of Trenton and Princeton. So uh, we uh, have on our event site on the 
on our website, which is uh, www.thenmusa.org, and you can find uh, registration. Um, we also, in the emails that you all have received, if you registered through our site, you will also get that uh, information on how to sign up for a ticket. And uh, he will talk to us about uh, revolutionary themes. So I want to thank, finally, our audience. We had a great audience tonight, great numbers, especially for uh, December, close to Christmas, um, to hear a great talk uh, by Paula Whitaker. And thank you. from those of us at the National Museum, we wish you all happy holidays and a good night. Thank you. Can I just can I just say one other thing, real sure. quick? Besides a thank you to you, very much. I very really much enjoyed this. Um, the different um, the diaries are digitized through at Haverford College. Um, the Civil War period is transcribed, um, and some letters that she wrote at University of Michigan are also transcribed. Um, but rather than give you all that, you know. Right now, if you want to go to my website, which is just paulawhitaker.com, I do have links to all those. And um, thank you. you know, you're welcome to dig into them as, as much as you'd like to. Well, thanks very much. And again, have a good evening to everyone and good night.